Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode I call Beyond Bizarre, Eight Extraordinary Extraterrestrial Encounters. UFO encounters are known for their high levels of strangeness, but the cases I'd like to talk about today I think take this to a whole new level. I have eight cases and five of these involve humanoids one involves an onboard encounter. Three are sightings, yes, but they involve some very interesting physiological effects and other details that you don't hear often. All of these cases have some unique and very unusual features that you don't hear a lot about, but I think provide some important insights into the nature of this phenomena. They come from all over the world, Europe, Africa, Canada, and all across the United States. And I think that they have some really interesting things to say about the UFO phenomena. So let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk about today occurred in Norristown, Pennsylvania in 1976. And the main witness, her name is Kathleen Tetty. This is in Northeastern in Norristown, Pennsylvania. And I will just let Kathleen describe what happened in her own words. As she says, My husband had just pulled his car out of the driveway, and I looked down, thinking about doing my laundry. Then I looked up again, and it was there, just hovering at the edge of the drive. Now this was daytime, and what she saw was a UFO, a sort of flying saucer, though more cigar-shaped craft she says, and I'll just quote her again, as she says, One whole piece with bubbled out windows from floor to ceiling. From one side, the ship appeared to be cigar shaped, but I think if I could have seen all the way around, it would have been round. It just hovered and never landed, but if I had a six foot ladder, I think I would have been able to climb on board. There was no sound, and it had blue and white lights. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So yeah, this was broad daylight. She was very, very close, close enough that she could easily see inside. And inside, she saw two aliens, probably we would describe them as gray type, but she also saw two human-looking people, a man and a woman. And again, I'll just quote her directly, as Kathleen says, There were two aliens. They were about four feet tall with large heads and big round saucer eyes that were dark brown. They had two holes for their noses. They didn't have all the rest of the nose that we have. They had a slit for a mouth but no lips. They had very long fingers, five on each hand, but the third and fourth on each hand were longer than ours, and they had pointy ears. Now according to Kathleen, each of these ETs wore a silver metallic gown with, she said, sort of rolled collars and cuffs, and they were both completely bald. Now, she couldn't tell whether they were men or women, but she could see the other two people, and they looked totally human. She said the woman looked, quote, like she was in a trance and kept looking in front of her. She had on a printed dress with no sleeves, had auburn hair, and was very light complected. The man had glasses, a mustache, and a cigar. He wore a jacket with tiny checks, a white shirt, and a tie. So she's watching this in stunned amazement right from her front doorway. And as she's watching, this object is just hovering there, tilting from side to side. And this allowed her to see into at least two or three of the ship's compartments. And again, as Kathleen says in her own words, the first one consisted of white formica-like countertops with buttons on top. Each button had hieroglyphics and the buttons were all different colors. They were about three inches by two inches in size and were red, blue, purple, orange, green, and pink. There were two leatherback chairs with very high backs and there was a red shag rug on the floor and on the wall behind the chairs. The compartment had an elevator door that opened to the side and had an arrow on it. 
Now the second compartment, she said, had four chairs situated in two rows close to the windows and kind of reminded her of the chairs you would see in a van. Now as Kathleen says regarding the ETs, I could see no feet, but the creatures floated and each had the woman under the arms to lift her up. The man still proceeded to look out the windows and the lights were on in all three compartments inside. So this went on for some time, 10 or 15 minutes. And this was when she realized that her nine-year-old son, Paul, was inside the living room. So she called him outside and at that moment, this object rose jerkily, she said. It went over the water tower behind her house and left very quickly. As Kathleen says, I think the sound of my voice did it. It just went whoop, whoop, whoop. I ran to the back of the house, but it was gone. So she kept this quiet at first, but was later interviewed by reporter Judy Baca of the Norristown Times Herald. And she admitted herself that her story was hard to believe. But as she says, it's part of history. It's here and it happened. I don't feel that it was a bad thing. So she felt no fear at all at any point during this encounter. But she did later get some confirmation of it. She later learned that her older son had a friend who saw a UFO in or around the same area. And she also learned that the daughter of a neighbor claimed that she saw a UFO in the same area at the same time that Kathleen did. And so she later came forward, Kathleen, after reading a UFO article by Philadelphia writer Tom Cleary, and he actually showed up at her house for a first-hand interview and brought along with him UFO researcher David Jacobs, PhD, and they interviewed her together. They asked her to draw what she had seen, but she told them she couldn't, as she says. I told them I couldn't draw it, but I would describe everything. Then they asked me to take a look at a book of pictures to see if anything looked familiar. I was so amazed when I got to about the fourth page and saw the pictures they had in the book because the creatures were what I had seen. I told Dr. Jacobs if he wanted to give me a lie detector test or some other kind of test, I would be willing. So after interviewing her, Dr. Jacobs was in fact convinced that she was telling the truth. And I'll just quote him directly. As David Jacobs says, The key thing is to see, does the report fit into the pattern of other reports? Another issue is the credibility of the witness. Tetty is not a lunatic, or practical joker type. This is not part of her personality. This is something that happened once in her life. It's not a pattern of events that she sees nightly. She did not embellish or elaborate. She is a good, solid, upstanding citizen, not a person who is trying to make a buck off of it. She's not telling it to gain fame or fortune. So you have to ask why in the world would someone bother to tell the story if it wasn't true. So yes, as you can see, there are some very unusual elements to that case. The fact that it occurred in broad daylight, that the witness was literally only maybe 20, 40 feet away from this object, which itself was only about 10 feet high, that she could see directly inside of it, the strange things she saw inside this craft. There's a lot that make this case very unusual and it's quite well verified having been investigated by David Jacobs and having there be other witnesses to UFO activity in that area at that time. It's a great case. And let's move on to our next one. This case took place in New Mexico, more specifically on a highway in Alamogordo, New Mexico, just south, outside of Alamogordo. And the main witness is 35-year-old Christina Bryant. Christina was driving along with her four-year-old daughter and a friend from Phoenix, Arizona to Lubbock, Texas, when all three of them noticed a strange light in the star-filled sky. 
Now, she wanted to keep her daughter amused, so Christina sort of invented a game, sort of talking to the lights and telling them to change colors, to turn blue and red, which, to her surprise, they did. And this went on for about 45 seconds. They would stop, and the lights would go off. The next thing they know, they had somehow left the main highway, finding themselves on a two-lane back road out in the boonies. There was lots of wildlife around them. They could see rabbits and deer appearing along the roadside. And they came around a corner. And this is when they saw something very unusual. A police car with funny lights and what appeared to be a one-car wreck. This vehicle was tilted at a very steep angle. And she said its battery was hanging oddly from the wrong side of the hood. There was a policeman there. He's carrying a flashlight and a clipboard, but he seemed to be in parade uniform, complete with braids and medals, which she felt was totally out of sync for a back country road. And so she, this officer actually reached out for her hand, resting on the frame of the open window. And Christina remembers a sudden chill going over her body as soon as he touched her. And in fact, it was so cold, his touch, that it scared her. And she was also confused because there was no sign of any accident victim. She remembers asking the officer about the wreck, and he asked her if they had passed anyone. So about 45 minutes down the road, they turned onto a highway junction truck stop, and this is when they noticed that it was now 3 a.m., and that they had, were missing uh, an hour or two or more. So she continued her drive to Lubbock, Texas and related the details to her mother who was surprised and actually produced a tabloid story with an article about a record number of UFO sightings apparently in the same area where Christina had been. So she sat on this for years. This was in May of 1976. But it wasn't until January of 1983 before she decided to do something to find out what happened during this missing time. And doing some investigation, she learned that people go under hypnosis to recover missing time, and she decided to do this. And under hypnosis, a different scenario emerged. Christina Bryant recalled that this, quote, policeman had opened the door and helped her out of her car, he was holding her hand the whole time. She said it was actually very nice, very kind and gentle. He looked like a normal guy, five foot eleven, about 170, 180 pounds, blonde hair, blue eyes, nice features. But looking over at the police car, she now saw that it wasn't a police car at all. It was a UFO, shaped kind of like a coolie hat, she says. There was a little ladder and she followed the policeman up into this craft. And she was motioned to a chair in front of a large window. She saw what appeared to be numbers appearing across the top of a screen, which she believed was some sort of directional finder with converging lines. And the policeman, she said, became kind of playful, pushing buttons that propelled them to fly against a rush of stars. It was very enjoyable. As she says, it was great. I was fascinated. I knew he was not going to hurt me. So he told her that his name was Oran, or Oran, she's not sure, but something along those lines. And at this point, the ship she thought was apparently an automatic pilot because he stopped piloting it and he led her to a doorway, which he opened with a motion of his hand. And this is when she became somewhat frightened because as she stepped through the door, she saw another man and two women standing in front of a cabinet next to what looked like a operation table, a surgical table. She saw her daughter, who was snugly asleep nearby on another table. And at this point, one of the women placed her hand protectively over the child. She recalled seeing some other things, such as white coats, a round-faced man of average height with no facial hair, uh, other figures, girls uh, with skin-tight skin caps over their heads. 
She said they all had very white, pasty complexions. At this point, she said she was examined. Uh, she saw one of the ETs holding a huge, what looked like a syringe and a long silver cylinder with what looked kind of like a stethoscope-like device. She found herself being floated onto the table, and she says the ETs scraped her skin on her arm. She saw them staring curiously at her stomach. She says at one point they stuck an instrument like a needle into her back. She said they took fluid from an eye and then apparently replaced it. And while under hypnosis, the hypnotist asked her to pay very close attention to the people who were examining her. And this is when she got another flash of fear when she realized that these were not humans, not people at all like she's used to. Uh, she says she saw that they had very tight white flesh and who she thought were boys uh, were not. They were not quite human looking, had a very small nose and mouth and huge, large, almond-shaped eyes with tiny little mouths that didn't even look functional. So it quite frightened her and that's basically what she recollected. Uh, her case was investigated by Bob Morgan, who at that time was head of MUFON San Antonio, Texas. And he said, I quote, she's very sincere and you can tell she was awfully scared. Now she is a good witness. She works for a major airline and really was reluctant to go public, but thought it was important to do so. And as she says, I don't want to be called a crackpot. I'm a level-headed, fairly intelligent woman. I don't want anyone saying, oh, there she goes, the crackpot. I'd like to tell the whole world, but I can't. So that case is the one involving an onboard experience, which I wanted to include because it involves a very strange screen memory, I guess you would call it. And it also, I think, is typical of many of these onboard cases which occur to people who are driving along a remote highway late at night. This does seem to be a pattern in a lot of these onboard cases. And yeah, some very unusual features to it. Let's move on to the next case. I love this case. It's quite involved. It occurred in Colusa, California on September 9, 1976. And there are at least six or seven groups of witnesses in three independent groups. So very well verified. The main witness is Bill Pika. He was watching TV at around 11.30 p.m. at his home at 1650 Wilson Avenue in Calusa when the screen, the television screen, suddenly faded out at the same time his air conditioner died he thought a circuit had been flipped in his workshop outside his home and he went outside to check on it and this is when he felt all the hair on his body standing up from electricity. So he's walking around in the dark and this static electric feeling started to get really strong and he thought it might be the underground cable but as he says, the further I got past it, I knew just about where the line was it was getting worse. I mean, it wasn't bad or nothing, but it was getting heavier. And looking up, this is when he saw a very large object hovering over his house and barn. And as he says, it wasn't making a sound, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And as I walked a little bit, I took another few steps, and then I was horrified. I realized what I was looking at. According to Bill, this object was about 50 feet above the ground, very low. He said the underside of the object looked almost like a glazed ceramic texture. It had a round shape in the center and a translucent shaft of grayish white light coming out of it. He also saw six wavy sort of lines or lights with what looked like frayed ends hanging vertically from the bottom of the craft, and on either side there were two pincher-like appendages. So the bottom, yeah, looked like white porcelain, but he said it could have been metal, with the light causing it to look sort of porcelain-like. 
And so he watched it for just a minute or two, at which point this object started to slowly back off to the west. And after it got about 150 feet away, he said three or four things occurred at the same time. First, these cable-like things that were dangling from the bottom of it were pulled up inside of it, disappearing. The pincher-like things on either end swiveled upwards and inwards about halfway. Third, two hatches on the south and north rims swung open. And fourthly, a spotlight came out of each opening. So this quite alarmed him. He ran into the house in a very excited state. He looked out the dining room window and saw that this object was still backing off towards his neighbor's house. He ran down the hallway and woke up his wife. He wanted her to see this object. So his wife, her name is Linda, she recalled him screaming at her, Get out of bed. You got to see this. So she did. She went up, got out of bed, down the hall. Meanwhile, he went into the bedroom where his son, Chris, age 10, was sleeping. She went into the dining room. But from his son's bedroom window, Bill could now see two additional craft. And these were hovering over the high-tension electrical power lines, not far away, sending down beams of light that he believed were siphoning electricity off of the power lines. He said the beams were bright blue and the whole area was completely lit up. At this point, the UFO that was closest picked up speed and darted away over to the mountains in just a few seconds. He could see the exact location because it was still sending down beams of light onto the ground. He ran into the dining room and screamed at his wife, Linda, You don't know what I saw. We have to get out of here. It's gonna get us. Now, Linda thought her husband was flipping out because of overwork or exhaustion. And as she says, So I looked out the window again, and it, the UFO, was starting to come towards us. Or I could see it getting bigger. So this caused her husband, Bill, to completely panic. And the UFO was getting closer. It, the beam that it was sending out had retracted. Now, meanwhile, there were other witnesses. A uh, Miss Elaine McGowan was just a quarter mile away at 58 Peoc Street, and she saw it too. As she says, Soon after I got in bed, the electricity went off, the fan went off in my room, and I got up, went into the living room, and turned on the lamp, the hurricane lamp, and then I walked outside to see if anybody else's lights were out or if it was a fuse in the house. So there was a huge power failure at this point, point over the whole area. And there was another witness, Fred, who was also watching this. And as he says, So I went inside to get my big brother Mark. I said, Come on outside, Mark. There's a UFO outside. Come on outside and watch it. But he said he was too tired and went back to sleep. So Fred went back outside to watch this UFO. And as he said, I made a mad dash back into the house to get my camera, but I had no film in it. So I went back outside and watched the UFO. So meanwhile, back at the Pika house, Bill Pika was becoming even more frightened. And as Linda, his wife says, he was screaming at me again. So I look up through the window, and by this time, this is when I see all the lights from the UFO on the Davises' house. That's their neighbor. Well then, with his screaming and what I saw out there, I knew I better move. To me, I still didn't have any idea what I was looking at. I really didn't know what I was looking at. This light, and it was scaring me, but I could not imagine how come it was scaring Bill so much more. So she was more concerned about her husband's agitation than the actual UFO. As she says, Bill's screaming at me to get the kids out of the house, and I was standing... Like I said, trying to figure out why he was so upset. And the minute I saw that the Davises' place was lit up, well, that really scared me. And I figured that between the state he was in and what I saw of that light over there, I'd better get moving like he told me to. 
So I went down the hall and grabbed my daughter out of bed, wrapped a blanket around her. I just went right directly out the front door and into the pickup. I guess when I went down the hallway, Bill must have followed me. So yeah, Bill was in a complete panic at this time. Uh, he says, and I quote, what I seen, what it was doing at Slim's house, that's his neighbor, I figured, I didn't know what I figured, I just figured that something drastic happened to their house. Because it was just glowing. He says the two UFOs over the power line suddenly shot into the sky in opposite directions. And this scared him even more. He says, when it did this, I was really petrified. I told my wife, we better leave. So thinking that these UFOs were coming for him, he grabbed a pair of pants and ran outside into the car. He didn't bother to put on any shoes or shirt. And as he says, or his wife says, he got to the front door and he screamed, the power's on, the TV's on, they're gonna see us. So she was already sitting in the car at this point. He ran back inside and turned off the TV set. And as he says, the back of our house, the windows were getting lighter and I knew it, the UFO, was coming closer and I was getting scared. And as his wife says, Linda, he closed the front door. In fact, he slammed it. I remember that. On his way out to the pickup, he was asking me if the key was in it. I didn't even answer him. He got in and he started it up. So he's backing out and became alarmed that the UFO was going to see his uh, lights on his car. And he screamed out to her, they're going to see my lights. My God, they're going to get us. So he actually turned off the headlights, turned off of his street, Wilson Avenue, and started accelerating at very high speeds, uh, well over, I think it was 90 miles per hour at one point. Uh, Linda, his wife, yelled at him to turn on the headlights, but he refused because he was afraid the UFO would see it. Uh, it was a moonlit night, so he could see to drive. And he raced off, and as they're leaving, this object was apparently pacing their car. Z says, I caught it out of the corner of my left eye. It was approaching us at a pretty fast rate, but it wasn't catching up. It was just staying there. And his wife, Linda, says, so we get down to the corner and he puts the brake on. Of course, the brake lights come on and he starts screaming, my God, they're going to see us. They're coming after us. Well, I never did turn around and look because I still didn't know what was making my husband so hysterical. So meanwhile, there's other witnesses about a quarter mile away, the McGowans. They saw this UFO, and as Elaine McGowan says, when we first saw it, it was a bright white light. And then when it started to move, this is when I noticed the orange cast to it. So yeah, multiple people are watching all of this happen. At this point, Linda Pekka says, regarding her husband, he didn't even slow down for the railroad tracks. I remember we sailed over them. As we got to the tracks, I remember him saying, I gotta get to Les's, I gotta get to Les's. And I remember thinking, I don't know. I'm still so confused because I don't know what's the matter with him. Well, their friends, Les and Gail Arant, lived at 846 13th Street, not far away. And this is really about 0.8 of a mile takes them only a few minutes to get there. And as Linda says, so we come around this way and just directly into their driveway, that's where he stops. He jumped out of the pickup and left the door open. And the next thing I know is he's beating on their door with both his fists, screaming at them. So yeah, he is quite emotional about all this. And at this point, their neighbor, Gail Arant, comes out and sees the UFO. She noticed this power failure. It was a really hot night, and she noticed that their air conditioner had shut off, and she thought that was strange. She realized all the other lights were off and didn't think too much of it because once in a while they do have a blackout. But she came out into the kitchen, and the dog was whining, and she got a flashlight, and this is when the electricity came on, and her neighbor, Bill Pekka, was pounding on the front door. 
As Gail Arant says, at the time I got to the door, he was pounding on it. I opened it. He was yelling at me to look up in the sky. And when I looked up, over in the west was this large object with a very brilliant white light underneath. You could see the outline of the top of it. It was dark in the middle, but you could see the outline. And it reminded me of a saucer, a cup and saucer. But it was turned upside down. It went from west to east. Bill and I were by ourselves on the porch. Now this object was close enough where they could hear a humming sound. According to the McGowans, who were just a quarter mile away, they said it was like a high turbine engine sound. But there was like a whirling, like a very high powered machine running at a very fast rate of speed. So meanwhile, the Arants called the police and the police officers Bill Wheeler and Peter Grevy showed up at the Urant's house and Officer Wheeler was surprised to see that Bill Pica was so agitated and wasn't paying attention to him so he reached out on to touch his shoulder and this is when Officer Wheeler got a huge electric shock uh, which quite surprised all of them uh, it was quite obvious to everyone that Bill was telling the truth because he was so emotional about it. So Pika told them what had happened, uh, explained it several times, and this is when his wife Linda realized, oh, <laughs> it's this UFO that is upsetting him so much. He was so emotional that uh, he couldn't drive. She ended up driving home. And it was later that day that they uh, drove out to the power lines the ones that were glowing red when this UFO was over them. They were expecting to find some scorch marks or anything, but they didn't see anything. But there were other witnesses. Investigators uh, found several other witnesses. One strange thing was that the neighbors at the Davis house said that their pear tree had bloomed about a week after the UFO sighting, which was quite unusual because the fruit had already been picked, but the tree was blooming again. Uh, and this was verified by investigators uh, who believe it might be related to this UFO sighting. Hard to say. There was another witness who does not want to go public. She just goes by Mrs. S. She decided to remain anonymous when this case was getting so much attention. But it was investigated by the police department, was investigated by people at the newspaper, and later by professional UFO researchers. So, a quite well verified case. And what I'd like to do is play a short audio clip of some of the witnesses. First, I'd like to play a clip from Officer Peter Grevy, who came onto the scene and interviewed the main witness, Bill Pica. UFO reporting center. Yeah, this is Officer Grevy with the Calusa Police Department in Calusa, California? Yes, sir. And we've just received two reports of UFOs, and there, we're with one subject now, and we figured it would be easier if he could describe it to you, or we've never called your number before, so we really don't know what the procedure is on it. But we just had a complete power outage in the county, and uh, when this fellow walked outside when he spotted it, and that's when, this, when another lady who was a reserve on our department also spotted it. Now, you say one party's with you? Right, I'm calling from his home now. And we thank you again very much for this. And if we get any more information on it, why, well, we'll get back to you people and let you know. Okay, and also the, the power was out for uh, three or four surrounding counties, too, that we monitor on the radio at the same time. Okay, how long was that out, you know? Well, it was out at my house for about five minutes. Went uh -huh. out five to one and came on about two minutes after because I was just getting ready to go to work. Uh -huh. It was out for about seven minutes. Okay, if you need anything else, you can get hold of us, I guess. Yes, sir, will do. Okay. And we thank you again. Okay. Here's another clip, an audio clip, of the main witness, Bill Pica, describing what he saw. Well, I never used to believe in it, but I do now. Um, around 1 o'clock, the power went off. And I have power running from my shop to my house, and I figured maybe it blew a fuse in there. I've been watching television. And I went outside very dark, with no lights anywhere, and I uh, had this funny feeling like static electricity around me or something, I don't know, I 
couldn't figure out what was wrong. I looked up behind the barn, which is right behind my house, and this giant object like an upside-down cup was just there, hovering, not making a sound, but weird-looking light. And I ran back in the house to get my wife, and it was already about, like, five or ten miles away. And it was coming back this time with three giant beams on the ground, lighting up the whole surface of the ground. And my neighbor has a crop dusting outfit behind my field, and uh, it lit their, their house up, and it was shining these weird lights out, like uh, spotlights. They weren't going out too far, but they were quite apart, far apart. And uh, it would come right for the house again, so I grabbed my kids out of bed, and we ran to the car and got in a pickup. And the damn thing followed us until we got to the cemetery, and then uh, I had to hit my brake lights because I was driving no lights to get over the hump. And uh, when I did that, it took off like a flash off to the right and went off towards the Sacramento area. And there was more than one. But I didn't have a chance to look at the other. It, it, this one's too damn close, you know. Yeah. But it was hanging over the barn, and it had this funny electricity stuff bothering you. I mean, it's like a, like you get a tingle. He was about 50 feet and counting the barn. He was right above the barn. Uh, well, I would say within 100 feet from my house to the barn. I couldn't see the above it because at that point, it was too many weird-looking lights drawing your attention. You didn't. I just couldn't take time to look the whole thing. That just scared me, you know. Uh -huh. But I did look at it for a good two minutes. I mean, I stood there, I was froze. And it doesn't make a sound. The, yes, when it took off, it looks like an upside-down... Well, I hate to say this, but do you know the movie they have on TV called uh, The Invaders? Okay, it looks identical to that. But it didn't light the ground up on the barn until it took off over there, and it stopped, and it had three lights. It lit up the ground under it in a huge, big circle. Well, this center one was a huge light that went straight down. Uh -huh. And then it had one out in front that went down on the ground, and then it had one on the west and right of it that showed on every power poles with the power poles on the 2047, and it looked like it was shining lights right on those those uh, electrical uh, those, uh, uh, transformers. And the lights was already out, already all over the whole valley, but it came, when I called the wife to the window, it was coming right at us again. And it had these bright, giant lights, but this time it only had one light. But it was a beam, a huge big beam, I'd say a couple, 300 feet in diameter on the ground, coming right at us. And I panicked and grabbed the kids, and we took off with no lights. <laughs> so I just fired it up, and it's a Chevrolet, you know, it takes a little bit. And I put it in reverse and backed out, and after the backup lights come on, and that scared me because I figured it's going to see us, you know. Uh -huh. And it came right over Bailey's trees, which is the next door neighbor to us, and they are eucalyptus pretty tall. And it just seems to know how to act to manipulate it, you know, on the ground maneuver. And it doesn't make a sound. That's what's weird. He ran along the side of us, within about 100 yards from us, and, and I was made to turn on the main road and hit it towards town as fast as I could with no lights. It was right there and I was getting pretty panicked and uh, my wife was too. But when I hit the railroad track, there was quite a little hump over it and I put the brakes and the brake lights came on bright red and I figured, oh Christ, he's really going to find us now, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, it took off off to behind us on the right of us and took off towards the Sacramento area. And it just went all that way so fast you can't believe it. It can make any turns it wants. It turns soft blue. I mean, kind of a purplish blue. When it took off? When it takes off, yeah. Okay. Say, I seen a good look of it there at the barn. Right. But the underneath's got some weird looking things on it. That's, uh -huh. what, that's what startled me. You know? Did it have any colored lights on it? Yes. It, it's kind of a frosty light. You know, it's not a, they're just uh, like a neon light. Right. And there's a series of little teeny things that go through the light, like, like little neon tubes. Uh -huh. Well, See, we have irrigation pumps on the canal. Oh, yes. And they're quite, I don't have any bullies, but they're quite a bit. And they're big, huge transformers, so I don't know if it was just looking at them or if it's drawing energy from them, but it looked like to me it's drawing something from them. It was as big as around as my whole barn. And the barn is pretty old, but it covered the whole top of it. Uh -huh. And the barn is probably like 75 by maybe 50, and it goes up pretty tall. I. Didn't, I called my neighbors because I was very worried about them when I got to town because it had this huge light over their house. And they own the airport. And I called her and she said that uh, they were 
asleep, they didn't hear anything or nothing. I told her it didn't make a sound. And I didn't want to tell her that I was waking her up and scared her. And she said she kind of believes in it, too, but she would keep an eye out. Uh, do you, you said that there was more than one object. Yes, there were three. I, I'm pretty sure there were three because there was the other two things going away. Is it coming towards us? And that's when I figured, holy hell's going to break a loose. I didn't, you know, I just was worried sick after it was there once that they well was going to come back and get it. <laughs> okay, now these the other two, were they similar to the one by no, the barn? See, they just had lights. They I see. Had, they looked like a smaller, two small ones. Okay, what color were the lights on those? They were, they were, uh, uh, hey, um, uh, they're a neon light. Neon light. Same. Same. Only they didn't have anything under them I couldn't see. They were, looked like smaller ones. I see, okay. But they went away fast. Uh-huh. But okay. they don't make no noise. <laughs> I can't see why a machine that big can't at least make something. Pretty interesting. I think you'll agree. And real quick, here's one last little audio clip from another witness, Elaine McGowan. Elaine McGowan? Yes. I'm calling for the UFO Reporting Center in Washington. Yes, sir. And we understand that you saw something in the sky last night. Yes, sir. I wonder if we could get a description of that. There was no shape to it that we could see. Uh, the, it happened about, oh, I guess maybe 25 minutes to 1. All uh, the lights had gone out in town, the street lights as well as house lights, and we walked out to the street to look up the street to see if we could see any lights further down. Uh-huh. And there was one big bright light. It looked like a street light was mounted up in the sky. We watched it for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. It was um, southwest of Calusa. It was stationary for about, oh, 10 to 15 minutes and then went in a northeasterly direction, northwesterly direction, pardon me, um, for maybe, oh, a minute, and then switched directions and went southeast towards Sacramento. Uh, the lights at that time came back on. They were on for maybe a minute and a half, and the object just disappeared. And there was a world, like a very, very high-powered motor would run, a very fine precision motor, that would just have a hum to it. Yes. You could hear this very, very distinctly. Oh, uh, it was quite a ways away from us. Uh, I, you know, uh, <laughs> with the lights out, so it's hard to listen. Right. Uh, it was south of town. I would say maybe a half a mile away from us would be at the closest point, and it was still a very bright kind of a orange, orange shade of, of light. Uh-huh. We could detect no shape except this, you know, one circle of bright light. Yes. Now you say this was definitely circular then. It, just the light that we saw. Yes. It was just like somebody had a, it would be like an airplane landing in your yard, the headlight of an airplane. You know, oh, I see. Okay. But there was no rays coming off of it. Oh, I see. Uh, when we first saw it, it seemed to be, oh, maybe 200 feet in the air okay. when we first see it. Then as it was going in the north-east uh, pattern, northwest pattern, it went up, you know, as it was, in other words, it didn't go straight across the horizon, it went up on an angle. Yes. And then when it finally shot the closest to us, it was a lot higher, or maybe close to a half a mile up from us, you know, straight up in the sky, and then it was going at a very rapid rate of speed. Okay, now, could you hear this humming sound at all times while you had it uh, When we first spied it, no, but when it started in motion... Uh, and started from the northeast and, and went to the south, I mean, from the northwest to the southeast, then it was very, very pronounced. Okay. We could hear it uh, over the motor of a pickup truck that had just driven by us. Well, it was, it did not stop after we heard the noise. Once we heard the noise, it was a steady, um, it was like an, uh, almost like an airplane motor going, you uh-huh. know? But it, at a much higher rate of speed, even than what a jet would sound like. Okay, now what about size? Can you compare that with anything? All right, standing on the ground and looking at it at a distance, it looked like five street lights flopped together. You know, okay. only one. Those amber lights. It wasn't amber. It was kind of a. It was a white, but it was. We had like a pinkish, ca- uh, orangish cash to it. I'm on the sheriff's department reserves, and I sat there and looked at it. But if I tell them, they'll think I'm an idiot. Because <laughs> we read. I have uh, five sons that are always reading about them. You know. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And I. They've been telling me, oh, I saw this light and I saw that light. Well, the one where we were standing out there, and yesterday was his 17th birthday, and he was out of his mind. Look what I seen on my 17th birthday, you know. So the, it, as far as it, it seemed to like, you know, I, I can't say that the light got any brighter or any dimmer. It just kind of stayed at one um, intensity. Okay, now in your opinion, was this thing under intelligent control? Definitely. Okay. 
And your son also saw this? Yes, sir. Okay. And that was the extent of the witnesses? In our area. Right. You know, we sat there and watched it. We didn't, uh, there was no one else around that time in the morning. Uh, one pickup went by. And then we were told today, uh, one of the police officers stopped by and visited with us. And he said that there was four separate sightings of four other individuals had reported it. Uh-huh. Which made me feel better. I think you'll agree that was one of the most dramatic sightings uh, on record, certainly involving so many witnesses, a power outage, the weird effects with the main witness feeling electrified, actually shocking the police officer, the fact that this craft was apparently siphoning electricity out of the power lines, causing a power outage. To me, the most bizarre element is the fact that this pear tree, which had already borne fruit, started blooming again. Can't say for sure that this is a direct result of the UFO hovering over it, but it certainly is unusual. And having heard from the witnesses themselves in their own words, I think it's a great case and definitely deserves a spot on this list. So let's move to this next case, which is equally bizarre. This next case occurred in Canada. This was in Montreal, Canada. More specifically at 6420 Cassegrain Street. And the main witness is Miss Florida Malbuff. She's 58 years old and this sighting occurred on January 6, 1977. Uh, she suffers from insomnia because of a bronchial condition and it was around 1.30 a.m. On January 6th, she was sitting by her window when she saw what she described as a big plate or a large oyster. She estimates about 15 feet in diameter drifting in the sky and coming closer towards her. She said it was silver gray and had lights on the base of it, dazzling lights. And as she watched, it landed on the rooftop across the street only 60 feet away from her. She could hardly believe what she was seeing. She actually pinched herself and rubbed her eyes. But yeah, this object was there. And she was watching it land on the actual rooftop, at which point two strange, very thin beings, quite tall, about six feet, five inches, came outside of this craft. She said they were dressed in a pale colored suit, very tight, no belts or markings. And she said they looked very light as they seemed to sort of bounce around or glide very easily. And as she watched, they moved towards the edge of the roof, looked down into the street, looked upwards into the sky, and then they apparently went back in the craft because moments later it rose up again, came into full view, and drifted off in a south direction. She said the whole incident from landing to takeoff lasted no more than a minute, it was really quite quick, but it shook her up, quite traumatized her. She wasn't able to fall asleep, and it was the next day that she told her 24-year-old son, Andre, about the sighting, and he didn't quite know what to make of it. He thought she might have been the victim of a prank. She was hesitant to call the police because she had no interest in flying saucers. She said, I didn't believe in it at all. The event upset me so much that I would have much preferred never to have seen that. But Andre, her son, could see that his mom was really agitated and that she had apparently undergone some kind of traumatic experience. So he decided he was going to investigate. He asked the neighbors, none who had seen anything the night before. Uh, he knew this building. It, uh, it was a vacant building and decided to go onto the rooftop, but there was no way to get on top from the inside. The only way to get to the top was through a fire escape. So he made his way across this six foot wide uh, chasm using a ladder, sort of a makeshift bridge. And when he reached the rooftop, he was pretty amazed by what he saw. There was a 20 foot wide circular sheet of ice covered by a thin layer of snow was obvious that some form of heat had melted the snow and the circle had subsequently frozen over. 
and there was a two other sort of oval shaped ice patches a few feet away and smaller layers depressed in the center. Uh, apparently what looked like footprints. Now, uh, seeing this, he immediately called a newspaper to report what had happened. And he also called air traffic control at nearby Dorville Airport. And they, were, he, they told him that they would inform U.S. NORAD headquarters, both in Canada and the U.S. And he was told that three other people had called to report a UFO in this area, drifting over the nearby Rosemont subway station. This was just moments after his mother's sighting. So the next day, newspaper reporters showed up, including Gilles Lafrance. They photographed the landing site, as you can see here. Uh, her son called the police, and two officers came to interview his mother, and they conducted an unofficial investigation. So this was published in the newspaper reports and created quite a scene, a lot of attention. And UFO researchers showed up to investigate. They were also able to take photos of this landing traces. Yeah, it got a lot of attention. So they walked up to the top of the building again, and this is when they did find what they believed to be four peculiar footprints originating at the center of this ice mass and going towards the roof's edge, which is where uh, Florida saw these beings. So these imprints were quite unusual. They showed the heel and toe marks of a boot, but not like a normal boot. These prints were only six inches long, 1.7 inches wide, so they couldn't have been made by an adult. It was also odd because it was very difficult to get to this rooftop. Uh, and they don't think it could have been a child. So it was clear there was a weird connection here. This was evidence of the humanoids that Florida Malbouf had seen. And it was clear that there was a heat source just from this landing trace marks. And also they found out that at the time she had her sighting, the dog of a neighbor was howling in such a way that the animal's owner was unable to calm it down. So yeah, this was quite upsetting to her and all the attention afterwards, and she said several times she wished she had never seen it. I love that case, although it does involve only one witness. It's really unusual the fact that she saw this so closely right across the street and the fact that this craft actually landed on the roof of the building right next to her, leaving landing traces and footprints. And it's very well investigated. I think it's quite credible and unusual and just so bizarre. But there's always more bizarre cases where that comes from. And here's another one that's equally strange. This next case is a bit briefer. This occurred in Telford, Tennessee, a very small town. It was on June 27, 1977. Edna Owens and her four kids were returning home from having gone shopping when they saw what they first thought was a shooting star. They had just arrived home. And as Edna Owens says, it looked like a falling star, but then it came down again. And as they watched, it hovered over a nearby field about 500 feet from their house, quite close. And as Edna Owen says, we got kind of scared. And I said, let's go to the house. It started moving over to the house too. So this is when they really got frightened because this object moved directly towards their house, actually stopped and hovered over the pond between their house and their barn. This frightened them enough that they all rushed inside and turned off all the house lights. And at this point, this craft came directly over the house. And as Edna Owen says, it was cloudy and dark outside, but in two or three minutes, the whole house lit up and I knew it was over the top of the house. I was standing in the hall when the lights started revolving around the house. 
I could sense rather than see that something was over the house. And they could see all the lights coming inside through the windows that lit up the whole interior. And they could also hear it, and it made a very strange sound. As Edna says, it's hard to describe. It was kind of crackling and popping like electricity. I guess I kind of panicked then. I told the kids we were getting out. I told them not to look up or back. Uh, her children, one of them, her name is Regina. She's 16 years old. She ran outside with her family to the car. She said she was too scared to look up. She just ran to the car. And then she says, I jerked open the car door. And as I touched the handle, I got a shock. That really scared me. So they all piled into the car and headed back into town. 11-year-old Donna Owen said, It was over the house. There were blue lights on it. It was round and it followed us. It was after us. She screamed at her mom, It's right behind us and on top of the car. So this object left their house and followed them for a few miles until they reached the local store. And as Edna Owen says, it stopped about 200 feet away and stayed there for 10 minutes. Then it just disappeared. It didn't go up, it didn't go down, it just vanished. I know I sound crazy trying to explain this, but what? But I saw what I saw. I never really believed in UFOs or took them seriously, not until this happened to us. A kind of sad end note to this case is Donna Owens, age 11, was so traumatized that she became uncontrollably hysterical. She was unable to be calmed down, and they actually had to hospitalize her. She remained there for a full week before returning home. I like that case because it involves four witnesses. They had quite a strong emotional reaction. What I found really interesting about that case was that one of the witnesses came out and touched the car and got a real bad shock. I think that fits the pattern that we're seeing in some of these cases. And what's also kind of interesting about that case is that one of the witnesses was so emotionally affected by it that she was hospitalized for a full week. That's very unusual. Quite a dramatic case. And here's another one that is probably the strangest of all of these on this list. You'll make up your own mind about that, but I think you'll agree it's definitely bizarre. This case is so weird. August 6, 1977. The main witness is a gentleman by the name of Tom Dawson, 63 years old, and he lived at, near Pelham, Georgia. This is about 20 miles north of Thomasville in Mitchell County. Uh, it was around 10.30 a.m. Tom, who's a retired automobile salesman, decided he was going to take a walk down to his favorite pond to see how it looked for fishing that day and he brought his two dogs with him. And just as he got inside the fence surrounding the pond, he says a circular spaceship dropped down right in between the trees and hovered just a few feet above the ground. And at this point, he found himself, his two dogs, and 20 head of cattle, all frozen in place by what he believed was an unseen force. He described this craft as being about 10 to 15 feet high, 40 to 50 feet in diameter. It had portholes all around it and a dome on top. It was totally silent, but it was changing colors rapidly. And as he watched, a ramp came down and out stepped seven bald-headed, white-skinned beings. He said they were, quote, white as a flour sack. They were quite short, about five feet tall, with pointed ears no visible necks, small upturned noses. They looked basically human, but looked different. It says there were five men and two women. Most of them wore tight-fitting one-piece suits, but one male and one female wore nothing, were absolutely naked. And they started talking in sort of a high-pitched gibberish, which he was not able to understand. Most of them started walking around those Two of them stood by the hatch as if guarding it, and a couple of others approached him. And he was unable to move as they lifted up his shirt 
and pulled down his pants and conducted what he thought was a medical exam of some kind. They placed a sort of skull cap like device over his head and a large hula hoop looking kind of device which was connected to a box and wires which they sort of passed up and down his midsection. And here's where this case goes from bizarre to absolutely off the charts strange. He heard a voice, he says, coming from this saucer, saying three times in perfect English, I am Jimmy Hoffa. That was repeated three times. It cut off at some point. Very strange. At this point, most of the figures returned to the craft, except for two of the males, who walked ten feet away and appeared to have a conference between them. He couldn't understand them. He says their voices were very shrill and gibberish. But at one point, he thought he made out the word Jupiter. Uh, he had the impression that they were debating whether or not to take him into the craft, uh, which quite frightened him. Uh, he said they started collected some leaves and stuff and were about to go into the craft, but one came over to him, approached him, and put his hand, open palm, on Tom's chest in what he believes was a gesture of goodbye. At this point, they got on their craft. It rose slowly 75 feet upwards and darted off. At this point, uh, Tom Dawson ran uphill, it was about 300 yards, to the trailer where he lived and tried to calm down. He couldn't. Uh, as he later said, I don't care what they say. This is the truth as I know it. I'm not crazy. I wasn't drinking. I've never had a mental condition. This is the first time I've ever seen anything like this. The whole time it happened, my mind was alert. I knew what was happening. I have not doubted since that it happened. I don't blame people who say I'm nuts. I've heard stories like this before, and I've said the same thing. But I do know what happened. There is no doubt in my mind that it did happen, just as I've told it. Now, he went directly to visit his neighbors, Jimmy and Linda Colby, pictured here. They saw him directly after this incident, and they could tell he was very upset. Uh, as Linda Colby says, he was in bad shape. He couldn't talk at all. I heard him coming and looked up to see him waving his arms and struggling for breath. He was wheezing and rocking, wild-eyed. He couldn't get his breath. She later talked to reporters and told them, oh, it happened to him. She said that he was a well-respected guy. They described him as a good, hard-working man, not a boozer, not a liar, not prone to wild ta tales, a good family man, not rich, but comfortable, no reason to make up stories like this. They were good friends. They invited him over often, helped him out with the, he helped them out with the garden. So yeah, they absolutely believe him. But he was so upset, they took him to the Mitchell County Hospital, where the doctor also confirmed that Tom Dawson was very sh shook up, both mentally and physically, from his encounter with this UFO and its occupants. He was treated for hysteria, given a sedative to calm him down, and later released. Tom later said that he believed if he had been a younger man, these ETs would have taken him away. But following this, he remained very quiet about his encounter. Yeah, I'm not sure what to make out of some of the elements of this case. It's apparently quite credible. The main witness, Tom Dawson, does have his neighbors who absolutely support him in his story and insist he's not lying. Uh, the description of the ETs, most of them walking around in suits, but two not having any clothes on. That's quite unusual. I don't know what to make of the Jimmy Hoffa aspect of that case. You can make of it what you will. This is what the witness reported. Hard to say. But yeah, a lot of really unusual elements to it. And like other witnesses, he was so emotionally upset by it, he had to be taken to the doctor. <laughs> Uh, a really remarkable case that I don't think is that well-known, but certainly deserves to be well-known. 
And now we move to another case, and again, it is just beyond bizarre. This is the second to last case I'd like to cover, and this occurred on January 3rd, 1979, in an area known as Mindelore, Kruger's Drop, South Africa. This was investigated by UFO researcher Cynthia Hind, and it's an amazing case. The main witness is Miss Megan Quizette, a housewife in her 30s. She was sitting in her uh, living room reading a book, and she looked at the clock and saw that it was about 10 minutes to midnight. And at this point, her son, Andre, came into the living room and said that he was unable to sleep and did she want a cup of tea? So she agreed, and it was then that they heard their dog, Cheeky, barking outside. Their dog, Cheeky, had recently been hit by a passing car and had been badly injured and had only recently been nursed back to health. So Megan was pretty concerned about him and watching him closely. So when he started barking, she went outside to call him uh, and she realized that he had somehow gotten outside of the gates and that he was probably going to bark and disturb the neighbors. She went to the front gate calling for him, but by this time Cheeky had gone up the road. So Cheeky liked Andre better than her, so Megan called out her son Andre to help get Cheeky back into the garage. Uh, he wanted her, him to go find the dog. Now they lived at number 14 Saul Jacobs Street, pictured here, and about midway up the street, at the top of it, there's a T-junction and a road there called Tyndall Road. Just beyond that, uh, a few feet away is another road that runs parallel to the road, and it was newly made at the time, and uh, this is where they saw the dog running towards, still barking frantically together with all the neighborhood dogs who were also barking. And this is when Megan saw a bright pink light at the top of the road and said to her son Andre, look, they've got lights on that road up there. And her son said, no, there aren't any lights up there, mom. And she said, well, then what's that very odd looking thing there? And she pointed towards this pink glow that you could see just above the road. And her first thought was that it was some sort of small plane that had come down on the road. And this is what she told her son. So worried about this, they quickly started walking up to the road, to this T intersection. And she could think of no other explanation for this bright light other than perhaps a plane or maybe it was a police car. But she couldn't hear anything and there was no uh, siren going off. So it was starting to look more and more strange. And as they got closer, they could see that this wasn't a plane and it wasn't a police car. It looked odd. Now she's a former nurse and she thought if there was a plane accident, she would be able to help. Uh, but as she got closer, she could see that this was an object encased by a very bright, absolutely pink light. It completely surrounded the craft. She couldn't see any actual light. It was just the whole thing glowing. And as they walked up right close to it, they could see that this thing was right on the road. It was egg-shaped from the top down and supported by four spider-like legs, not very thick, with a pad at the end of each leg. Each leg was about three and a half feet high, she estimates. And she estimates the craft itself was about 12 feet high and maybe 15 feet wide. She felt no fear at this time. She thought maybe it was some kind of government experimental craft. And she stood there, her and Andre, speaking quietly together, discussing what this might be. And uh, at this point, as they're watching, five or six men stepped out of the craft onto the ground. And two remained near the craft, and two others came close to where they were standing. And they started talking in what she said was monosyllables. And the one that was talking had a very high-pitched voice. And she said the words sounded kind of sing-song. 
She could not hear the actual words, just the sound of it. And Andre, the son, saw one of the men on the far side bend down and start picking up sand from the sandy bit off the edge of the road. And they were talking, and as he saw this man lifting the sand and letting it trickle down through his fingers, Mac Megan actually saw them bend down and touch the road. And she says she could hear them talking. She did not understand this language, but it was kind of close to Chinese and very high-pitched. She couldn't see their faces very clearly, but she says they were all dressed in overalls with only their faces showing, except for two of them who had their heads uncovered. And one of these two guys who were close to them approached. Uh, he was one who had his head uncovered, and according to Megan and Andre, he had thick, dark, curly hair and a beard. And uh, suddenly, they, they appeared to be surprised to see that they were being observed, these uh, UFO occupants. And seeing Megan and Andre, they took a step back. Now, Megan is five and a half feet tall. And she said that these guys were shorter, probably about five feet tall, very slender. Uh, the soup covered them from head to toe, so she couldn't see any of their muscles or structure. But she says the suit went right over their feet, all the way up to their heads. Only their faces were visible. Uh, she thinks the color of their suit was white. Andre thought it was pink, but she thinks, no, that was just the light from the UFO. The craft itself looked sort of metallic lead. It had no contours to it, no fins, just totally smooth. Megan realized at this point that the bearded man was looking directly at her. And still looking at her, he bowed low to the waist and had said something that Megan thought was a greeting of some sort. And all this time, his eyes never left her. Her son Andre said, and I quote, The man said something with three syllables in it. I heard it quite clearly. So Megan was impressed, and she said a soft hello and laughed nervously. And this man with the beard, who she presumed was in charge, she said he had ordinary black hair. He was very dark-skinned, Middle Eastern-looking, she thought, sort of olive-colored skin. Uh, she couldn't tell the color of their eyes, uh, but she had the impression that his eyes were different, kind of translucent, almost, looking. So he bowed and greeted her, and she just stared back. And this is when she realized that something was not right, this was not normal. And she turned to her son, Andre, go and get Daddy, and run. Please run. So Andre realized that this was very unusual. He ran, he became frightened too, and ran away. He never expected to see anything like this. And the next thing, she knew these guys were jumping back into their craft. She said they did it very easily, almost floating up into it. The, the hatch to this craft closed, and within seconds, she heard this loud buzzing noise. She said it was like, quote, bees in a hive. Suddenly, the legs elongated to about three times their length. The legs came from the bottom of the craft and elongated to the size of the craft itself. In the meantime, Andre, who had been running away, stopped when he heard this buzzing noise. Megan herself stepped back. She was a little bit afraid, not knowing what was going to happen next or whether to run or not. At this point, the object went upwards, went slightly to the left. The legs started telescoping back into the craft. The craft hovered for a second or two and then shot off into the sky very quickly straight up into the clouds and was disappeared in about 30 seconds. Though she could see this pink color from the craft illuminating the clouds for a little bit while longer after the craft itself was invisible. She estimates the whole episode lasted about 10 minutes, though she says it seemed much longer. After it had gone, they returned to the actual site and didn't see anything on the tarmac. No marks or anything were found. Uh, they did report it to investigators. There was one who was skeptical, but the rest of the team felt that these 
people were telling the truth. And interestingly, there was another sighting on that day at 11.50 p.m. in the same general area. This is in Mindalore again. And the second case involved apparently a missing time abduction. A man and woman were driving in foggy conditions near a mine when they described seeing a gray cone-shaped craft with four legs and experienced a 20-minute lapse of time. And they also recalled seeing humanoids. I really like that case because it shows what often happens. A witness is drawn outside by their dog barking. In this case, it was their dog Cheeky, their cheeky little dog Cheeky, who drew them outside. And they ended up having a real close-up encounter with a landed UFO and occupants who were human-looking. I like this case because it does have two witnesses, a mother and daughter. It's quite long-lasting. They were right up close to this object, so there's no chances of misperception. And the ETs being very much human-looking, though not quite fully human. It's an extraordinary case on many levels. Now let's move to one more case. Here's our last case. This occurred in mid-July of 1988 at a wildlife reserve in Lugo. This is near Galicia, Spain. And I got this case actually from two news clippings from England, one of which was provided by English researcher Timothy Good. And yeah, this case does sound bizarre. I mean, it is. But it's apparently a serious report and was investigated by a team of researchers, including Spanish researcher Jose Diaz Salazar of Madrid and Rex Duta from England. And yeah, it was around mid-July in 1988, broad daylight at a wildlife game reserve in Lugo. I could not find the exact wildlife uh, reserve spot. But this area, according to witnesses, was visited by a UFO, which was described as about 250 feet long, shaped like an upturned bowl with purple lights. And according to eyewitnesses, it sent down a beam of orange light over a herd of elephants. And as they watched, according to the report, 26 elephants were pulled up in the beam of light and into the craft. Now, one of the witnesses did give her name. Her name is Imelda Gil Casares. And she told Jose Diaz Salazar that she was driving through the reserve with her children when this incident took place. She and her children watched the entire incident. And as she says, and I quote, I thought it was some kind of staged managed stunt at first when I first saw the spaceship. But when all those elephants went up into the air, into the UFO, I became frightened. The children were screaming and laughing, but I was speechless. And according to her, this episode lasted only about two minutes. Uh, and according to researcher Jose Diaz Salazar, who interviewed her, he says it's one of many incidents involving more than 200 animals from various zoos and safari parks all over the world, and he says the past six months, and that governments are aware of it. And researcher Rex Duta looked into the case, and he says, after investigating the sighting, I'm convinced it did happen. This sort of thing isn't new. It's been going on for many years. Space people are taking us and our animals and adapting them so that they will be able to survive in the future. And I agree with most of that. There are a lot of cases. I've investigated some myself where animals are taken up into craft and apparently not returned. Rabbits, deer, crocodiles, elk. There's many cases like this. Now there was, of course, some skeptics who pointed out that this craft was only 250 feet wide and how could 26 elephants fit inside this craft? And researcher Rex Duta pointed out correctly that the interior of UFOs are often described as being much larger on the inside than they appear on the outside, 
And he also pointed out that ETs do have the ability to shrink objects, which again, I agree with because I investigated that myself. It does happen. So true or not, this case does fit in with many other similar reports of animals being taken. But yeah, it's very bizarre. You can make of it what you will. Yeah, that's the last case, and I think probably the most bizarre of the bunch. You can make of it what you will. I considered not including it, except for the fact that there is a first-hand witness quoted, and... There, it was apparently investigated, and it's not the only case involving animals being taken on board a UFO. I've documented many others. This is the first one involving elephants, so I don't know, but it absolutely fits the pattern we do see in other cases. So those are the eight cases I wanted to talk about today, and I think you'll agree, these are all beyond bizarre, do have some very strange and unusual elements, and in some cases, utterly unique. But they do, for the most part, follow the patterns we see in many, many other cases. And really, each time you hear these cases, you have to remember, this is only the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of people do not report their encounters. And that's especially true if they contain bizarre elements. So I have to give kudos to each of the witnesses who did come forward and spoke about their encounters because that does take a lot of courage so that's our episode today i really want to thank you for watching i truly appreciate it and until next time keep searching for answers keep looking for the truth and most important of all keep having fun bye now